I'm here again at uh, Infosec 2024 with Ilya from Quokka. Hi Ilya, thank you for taking the time to come and chat with me. Chris, thanks for the invite, happy to. Um, first things first, Quokka, um, what is it and you know, what problems are you trying to solve? Sure, so we address the mobile security space. Um, we sell to Fortune 500s with a vendor of choice for uh, the US government, the UK government, and some other governments worldwide. Yeah. And what we have is uh, about 12 years worth of mobile contextual security information. We started out with a DARPA grant in the US, have grown since then, and our entire focus is on the mobile ecosystem. So in a nutshell, whether you are making an application that you're putting into the store, or you are, like the, all of us, consuming mobile applications on our devices, we can protect that ecosystem. We can protect different things from start to finish, if you will, in the mobile world. Right. So um, in kind of layman's terms, what are some of the bad things that you're trying to stop? Yeah, so in a nutshell, the mobile ecosystem is different from traditional security for a desktop, right? On a desktop, you're thinking of, if I have somebody be able to access it, they can take my files, they can take whatever's on that desktop. And so security is usually done from that point of view of access to the device. But in mobile, the apps are the endpoints. An average mobile device has about 80 apps. None of us have a mobile device with just one app on it, right? Those apps work together, sometimes for good, sometimes not. And they have a lot of risk. So the actual threat surface that we're looking at is about 80 apps on about 4 billion mobile devices. That's a huge threat surface. And the threats are zero days. That's what we're really talking about. So traditional desktop, you have you know antivirus goes on there, looks for signatures, identifies malware, and that's the approach that has traditionally been done on mobile is based on signatures or monitoring the network. When you move beyond that and you realize that every app has its own essentially repository of data, access to device sensors, access to your private store in a non-traditional file kind of approach, each of those apps has its own security threat. And what we do is essentially identify malicious apps, identify apps that are actually colluding with each other potentially to um, provide a higher level of access. Privileged apps, we've given them cute little names, like gangster apps are apps that are exploiting a particular vulnerability on a particular device in order to exfiltrate data without the user knowing. We have harvester apps that by design are slurping up all the info that they can from your device, whether you like to or not, which can then be fed into a phishing campaign. We have a lot of other cute names, but that's the threat surface as we see it, and that's what's unique and kind of new in the world of mobile. That's really interesting, and certainly kind of moving away from trying to solve the mobile issue with legacy desktop and server approaches. So, like you said, I can see it just doesn't work. I've been speaking to a lot of people around the show around kind of general data security, information security. You know, for me as a CISO, what are some of the things, you know, speaking to your clients and speaking to your network, that are some of the big data security issues that you're seeing? Yeah, so traditionally, um, data security has always, uh, again, revolved around the device level access. Yeah. Um, then the world switched to cloud, so now there's a lot of new tools on the market that basically protect your cloud access, either through identity management, zero trust, you know, all the usual buzzwords. Yeah. And as again, as I said, now that we're moving to look at the apps themselves, um, the, the unique threats there are different, and that's what we're really looking at. Do you think there are too many buzzwords in today's cybersecurity industry? There's, yes, there's always too many buzzwords. Yeah, I think AI being one of them, so don't worry, we're not going to be talking about that during this interview. We are, however, going to be talking about ransomware and just thorny question that there's, you know, I don't believe there is like a straight answer to, but I'm asking everyone regardless. So, governments are starting to talk around. Uh, making the payment of ransomware demands illegal, so criminalizing yeah. that. Um, is that going to solve the issue of ransomware? Is that indeed even the right question to be asking? I don't see how that's going to help any more than you know the same strategy was applied to terrorism. And while arguably it has had some effect, it's still a reality. So will that make the ransomware go away? Probably not. It's too easy to lock down your system and prevent access. And the, the threat of payment is, or, or rather the threat of non-payment is becoming very real. So in the US, you know, we had the United Health problem recently where you know, like it, a third of the medical payments were not able to go through. That is just literally hundreds of billions of not just money, but lives, millions of lives, billions of dollars. So if you don't pay the ransom, 
you know, is that really going to, like, is that a solution to that problem? That problem already exists. So the answer is probably no. Is there a better, you know, the question I like to always ask in these situations is, okay, you're saying this is going to become illegal. What solution are you offering to the problem, if not that one, because you made that one illegal? Exactly. I was speaking to someone recently, and they were saying it's a matter of looking at all the options and choosing the least bad, because there isn't often a binary choice between what is specifically the right thing to do and the wrong thing to do in the short term in these circumstances. Again, these are criminal organized gangs, and I'm not entirely sure, you know, through the history of organized criminal gangs, by threatening their revenue stream, doesn't make them suddenly get legitimate, you know, lawful jobs. Generally speaking, the attacks intensify, at least in the short term, so uh, I'm also not convinced. But it is an issue that needs to be discussed and, you know, there's a, needs to be done. I, I was speaking with a colleague in the medical space actually just last week, and he told me that ransomware is actually adapting. The, the thing I was going to say is simply these folks always adapt. Yes. One of the ways they're adapting is they're no longer simply encrypting the information and just blocking you from using it. They have started changing the information. So if you are a, a medical organization and all your medical records are in the cloud, in the system, if you block access to it, that's bad because business can't get done. So you switch to paper forms and manual records and you kind of have some business continuity plan. Yeah. Now imagine they go in instead, once they have the access, instead of encrypting it and giving you a ransom demand, they simply change it so that everybody's allergies are twisted upside down and blood types get switched from an A to a B and a B to an A. And then they go to you and they say, hey, I didn't mess with your data. I mean, I didn't block you from accessing the data. I made it worse. I changed it all. So, so all you of these no people, longer trust the you can't trust integrity your data. of this data. Yeah. If you want to restore it back to the way it was, pay me a ransom and I'll restore it. Arguably, that's worse because those people are not simply not going to make their payment or not be able to you know, have a blood work done. They will actually be injected with the wrong drugs. They will actually be you know, provided the incorrect medication. Their allergies will be reviewed differently, right? I mean, these are, this is like next level threats. And that's in the medical space. Imagine you take that to the financial space. I didn't lock all your accounts. I just moved money around and transferred all the bits. Aerospace. That's worse, right? Aerospace, critical national infrastructure. Exactly. My words, you've, uh, you've certainly brightened my day. Ah, here. You're, yeah, thanks, great, thanks, I will you. let my colleague know. Thank you for being so upbeat and uh, right. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> but, absolutely. Um, okay, we'll end on a, like, a really simple question, and it's like a quick fire round type question. Data leaks to data breach, which one is worse, if indeed are they any different? Data leaks versus data breach. I think the data leaks are worse because they enable future data breaches. I think uh, the idea is data leads to phishing, which leads to, in this case, ransomware, but it could lead to other things as we just discussed. Yeah. So really, the source of it all is the data and the questions that a lot of vendors, not just us, we, we do it in the mobile space, other vendors are doing it in cloud and desktop and you know private environments. The question is, how do we stop that data from leaking to reduce the phishing attacks, which will then reduce the overall you know, ransomware or other things that could be done with that data? Great answer, and it's been great to chat to you. Ilya, thank you so much Chris, for your time. Thanks very much. Take care.